a very warm welcome um, to this third member showcase um, where we want to provide a space for people who are passionate about civic engagement to come together and to share their work. Um, I'm Paul, Paul Manners, Director of the National Coordinating Centre for Public Engagement, and we're one of the partners in the network. And uh, I'm delighted that Shireen and Wana from the Civic University Network core team based at Sheffield Hallam are, are with me today to help us run the session. And um, we've got a fantastic programme. I wondered, Shireen, if we could just see the, um, see the agenda uh, for today. We're hearing from two, um, two cross university teams. Um, and I think that's a real theme for today. People working across uh, a kind of quite large, very populous um, geography to develop civic work and at different stages uh, of their work as well. And um, it's going to be thought provoking. It's going to be very practical as well. And after the event, we'll make sure the slides and links to relevant resources are available for you so that you can you can go and find out more. Um, we're going to hear later from three uh, civic engagement leads in East London at Queen Mary University of London, University of East London and at London Met. And uh, while each are involved in lots of partnerships across the whole of London, we're going to focus down on their work to build a common approach to civic work in the borough of Tower Hamlets. Uh, it's it's very emergent work. It's it's kind of bottom up. Uh, it's really exciting. So we'll hear more uh, later from London, but we're going to start in Manchester, um, where the five universities working across the city region have recently launched a Greater Manchester Civic Agreement involving all 10 authorities, the Greater Manchester Combined Authority and the Mayor, Andy Burnham. So, you know, quite sort of spectacular scale um, of activity there to, to report on. So there's going to be an opportunity for you, first of all, just to tune in uh, to the Manchester story and then a chance to ask questions. Um, before I hand over to, to, to the team at Manchester, I just wanted to show you the next slide that some of you may have seen. And I think it provides kind of an interesting context for today. Those of you who, who enjoy Wonk HE, um, a kind of platform for reflection on HE policy, have probably seen this, um, that Jonathan Grant, who used to be uh, uh, at King's College London and very instrumental in their kind of service agenda. Um, Jonathan wrote a very provocative uh, thought piece really yesterday that challenges us, I think, um, about our civic work. And he came up with the lovely phrase, civic wash, a civic wash. Are we perhaps approaching our civic work in more in a kind of PR exercise than showing a real fundamental commitment to our places and our, our communities? Uh, and he particularly focuses on the number of universities who actually manifest their commitment to civic by creating living wage um, agreements for their staff. And, and that's something I'm sure our, our speakers will, will help us reflect on a little later today. But it does provide us with, with a, little bit of, um, a little bit of spice to the conversation today. But let's get going and, and let's start um, with our colleagues in, in Manchester. Uh, we've got three speakers. Uh, we've got Michael, uh, Charlotte and Julian, who, who are going to kick us off. And they're going to spend around 20 minutes explaining what they've done and some of the key lessons learned. And then we'll have time for some questions and then we'll turn to our, our colleagues from London. So I think, Michael, you're going to kick us off. Perhaps you could just briefly introduce yourself and then, and then begin to tell the story for us. Thank you. Thanks, Paul. Yes. Hi, everyone. I'm, my name is Michael Stevenson. I'm Director of Public Affairs. At Manchester Metropolitan University. I'm going to kick off the presentation, of course, is about 20 minutes. Uh, the structure is I'll talk a little bit about uh, the background to our agreement and the journey we've been on. Uh, Julian Skirm from University of Manchester will talk about uh, some of the things that drove the project, including some polling and data. And Charlotte Morris from uh, uh, Salford will talk about where we've got to and what comes next. And I should say on, on Paul's point, yeah, we, we, are, we are all living wage employers in case anyone's wondering about that. Um, just a bit of context then, Sh Shireen, could you move us to the next slide, please? If you look at the top left-hand corner of that slide, you'll see a map which is basically Greater Manchester, uh, the 10 local authorities. So to put it in context, uh, our agreement covers uh, 10 local authorities, uh, a directly elected mayor, 
a combined authority, about 2.8 million people, about 100,000 students and five higher education institutions. So, so quite, quite, a bit, quite a bit going on there. Um, in terms of the background of how, we, how the journey started, we are obviously aware of the work of the Civic University Commission and obviously a city the size of Manchester had to be part of that, it was inevitable. So discussions started between ourselves at Manchester Metropolitan and University of Manchester about a, a, a Manchester agreement just with our local authority based on the experience in Nottingham, which was seen as a successful example of a univers two universities that had um, partnered with one local authority. But we we're also aware that Salford had plans too with their own particular local authority and directly elected mayor. So we thought it was obvious that we should look at maybe a more um, ambitious approach, which was bigger and different and reflected the unique circumstances of our city region, which as I say, are five institutions, huge student population, all those institutions having different strengths and complement each other. A strong track record of working together, not just the pre-existing um, collaborations on various things that all institutions do, but also as a result of COVID, we were much more collaborative anyway. We were meeting more regularly and looking at shared solutions to problems. So we had that, we had that working together ethos. And then underpinning all of that was the, the GM devolution model. So as I say, you know, mayor, combined authority, 10 local authorities. And as you can see on that screen, there's a lot going on in the policy environment in Greater Manchester. And it gave us a real, a real opportunity to address big issues, be strategic and engage with, you know, a, a mayor and a combined authority, which were big players on just, not just the regional stage, but the national stage. And then that journey led us to setting up a little working group of the five, one, one person from each institution, feeding weekly into meetings of our vice chancellors. We enlisted the help of Public First, an agency that had worked uh, on the Nottingham Agreement and we found their input invaluable. We engaged uh, with the mayor's team and the uh, combined authority on their priorities, their expectations. And also we had a little challenge, which I think all of us should bear in mind is that because you're, you're engaging with civic partners, they are also political entities. And we, there was an election in, right in the middle of our process and we had to take account of that in terms of both the timing and manner of what, what we're releasing. And so ultimately, we ended up with an agreement that I think was um, reflected both our, our strengths and priorities, but also the priorities of our civic partner. And, I, and, and Charlotte will elaborate a little bit on the, on the six themes that, that, that make up our agreement. And we launched that agreement in September last year. We've established a board now to, uh, to take that work forward and start implementing the agreement in 2022. So some themes and learnings from it. Obviously, scale is a big theme of what we tried to do. We deliberately wanted to make this a large, uh, a large scale uh, agreement, engaging with with a, sig a significant central partner and the ten local authorities that are also part of Greater Manchester Devolution. Uniqueness is a theme too, I think, both in terms of the place, the circumstances of Greater Manchester, and the civic structure that we are working with uh, in terms of de devolution. Collaboration, as I said, a massively important part of this. You know, it really helps when you're working together, you recognize that you can complement each other and not compete with each other. And then finally, just the idea that the whole thing is, is underpinned by the sense of a shared agenda, you know, co-producing an agreement with our civic partner based on some agreed themes, agreed priorities, and those are priorities and themes that, that we all share. So I hope, I hope I've kept to time for that because I, because I don't want to, I want to give Julian a bit of time now to talk about some of the learnings we got from the, from the polling and the community work that we've done in the, in the development of our agreement. So Julian, I'll hand over to you now. Thank you very much, Michael, and good morning, everyone. It's great to see so many familiar colleagues and a few unfamiliar ones. I hope you're all well. Um, just to pick up on what Michael said then, one of the themes obviously of civic agreements is the extent to which we can uh, take, take account of the perspectives of local residents and we had this very early sort of Venn diagram which I haven't put in the slides today but it had three facets in it it had what the capabilities and strengths of the three uh, of the five universities were on one hand we had uh, some of the policy documents and the uh, policy agendas of Greater Manchester and particularly um, looking at what the mayor and the combined authority were looking but perhaps the most important thing, um, and speaking very much to Jonathan's challenge to us, uh, Jonathan Grant's challenge to us to ensure we're not civic washing, to what extent do we 
take account of the views of local people in the construction of our agreement. And there's lots of people on the call today who will know that universities, in terms of their public engagement, you often get the extremes. You get people who praise you and they'll write to tell you you've done something well and you get people who criticise you. Uh, and that silent majority, perhaps, is what universities don't always know, know so much about. So we were keen to ensure that our agreement was evidence based and built on the perspectives of local people. So I just wanted to pick out a few key themes that we had reams of data on on this. And we sampled a thousand people across Greater Manchester, representing the age ethnicity, location of where people live to make it a representative sample. And as, as Michael says, we worked with the agency public first on this and they did a, a great job. So we did this survey in February of 2021 and we used this evidence to build up our agreement. So the first thing I wanted to highlight is we asked people um, what their top priorities were. Forget the universities for a moment. What, what was on people's minds across Greater Manchester in February 2021? Um, and no surprise, you no know, economic recovery from lockdown. Um, people could pick three of these um, areas, and that came out by far the highest. As you can see, it's an outlier. Followed up then around um, unemployment, inequalities, health, job security, and environment. So we uh, had an evidence base there for what were the big themes that people what, what, what were on people's minds. Um, next slide, please. I realize I'm going to have to do the uh, Chris Whitty thing. So my great civil servant, Shireen, now is pressing the slides for me. Thanks, Shireen. We, um, so we, we then asked uh, people across the city region, what, uh, what would, what, um, how proud are you, if at all, of the role that local universities played in Greater Manchester? And we found here that 71% were either very proud or fairly proud. All five universities in the agreement also had access to this data for their own institutions as well. We've never published that. Um, that's uh, information for those individual institutions. But in the case of my own institution, the University of Manchester, we're using that as a, a, a benchmark in some of our um, communications and marketing strategies in the university to think about what the um, perception of the university is and does that change over time as a result of us uh, taking forward some of these priorities in our agreement. Uh, so we, um, I don't think we were um, uh, displeased by that. I think there's room to improve, but certainly 71% uh, saying proud or very proud was quite Decent. Next slide, please, Shireen. What we then saw, though, is there are um, 2.8 million people in Greater Manchester. Some of the local authorities are around half a million in size, some as, as low as 240,000-ish. Um, if you look across them, though, across that geography, you can see differences in levels of pride in the universities. So where three of the five institutions are in our Greater Manchester agreement is the city of Manchester. So that's University of Manchester, Michael's Institution, Manchester Met, and the Royal Northern College of Music. Um, so you probably would expect Manchester to be the, either the highest or the least high, I would have predicted beforehand, um, because people who live in that area will have more uh, connection to a university. They will see students, they will see staff, they will know a bit more about the um, estates of those institutions. You, you would probably expect that. This is an important theme, though, um, in terms of levelling up and the extent to which some parts of the country don't have a university. So you can see 56% of people proud in Oldham. Next slide, please, Shireen. Uh, in terms of who's visited us, uh, we asked this. We were a little bit surprised, but when you come to think of it, 2.8 million people, 41% of people either have visited or can't remember if they have visited in the past few years. 59% uh, saying they never visited. Um, we would like to have seen that smaller, but it shows you the extent to which, if you think perhaps around four in 10 people in our city region have experience of higher education, it, it, it kind of fits in with that perhaps. Next slide, please. So that was interesting for us. Um, the next thing I thought was quite interesting, we asked um, people to either agree or disagree with the following statements about our universities. And, um, it was really encouraging. 77% of people across our city region uh, said encouraging students to come to Greater Manchester is good for the region's economy and culture. We were um, encouraged by that. I thought that said something really positive about the role of the universities in civic life. Um, also, people recognise we're important in terms of um, being drivers of economic growth. I think what was more challenging for us um, was... 34% um, of people said 
in Greater Manchester, the university's contributed positively to me and my family and friends. And I think in an area where there are quite low levels of participation in higher education, you may expect that. But of course, universities, it's not just about going to study as important as that is. It's also about the wider benefits of universities. So there's a little bit of work there. And we spend quite a bit of time trying to dissect this. Next slide, Shireen. And then we asked them, what benefits do you think local universities bring to Greater Manchester, if any? Now, this was really, um, really quite interesting, I think, because it, it showed us uh, what people think of the benefits. Uh, and you, we, we allowed people to tick anything that they thought applied. So there wasn't um, a limitation on this. They could have ticked all of them. But what we found is the most popular answer was about training future professionals to work locally in key areas, such as teachers, doctors, nurses, engineers, etc. 56% of people um, ticked that box. And I think that certainly for myself, working in a very research intensive institution, it was quite um, an important insight for us because research, if you look, came out as 44%. And we definitely spend more time talking about our research than the impact of our graduates. Another interesting thing, we spend a lot of time, I'm sure we all do on the call today, talking about the volunteering that our students undertake, which is a really important feature of public and civic engagement. But that came out, uh, half as many people mentioned that as a positive impact of the university. That core feature, the thing that's um, staring us in the face, if you like, is we're producing skilled professionals of tomorrow, 56% of people thought that was a benefit compared to 28% in terms of student volunteering. So I thought it was an important lesson there about the emphasis and perhaps those core functions, the research and teaching is where um, lots of the public would um, naturally uh, veer towards when asked about benefits. So next slide, please, Shireen. So what I'm going to do now is hand over to Charlotte, uh, my colleague from the University of Salford, and Charlotte's going to talk about how we use some of that polling to inform the priorities and more recently the governance for what we'll do. So thanks a lot, Charlotte. Thanks, Julian. Um, and hello, everyone. Yeah, as Julian and Michael have suggested earlier on in the presentation, um, we kind of had a Venn diagram of how we want to come up with what we want our civic university to say. Uh, and we wanted to be informed by our local and regional priorities, the sort of political and, and, and policy background. We wanted them to be informed by our own university's expertise and also the public priorities, uh, as Julian's just outlined. So what we came up with was the six quite broad themes that you can see on the slide there. Education and skills, net zero, creative and cultural economy, the digital economy, reducing inequalities and jobs and growth. Just have the next slide, please, Shireen. So we're conscious that those are broad themes and they are intentionally so. Um, and what we did to sort of break it down within the civic university agreement to sort of um, bring those themes and those priorities to life was um, kind of reduce it down to statements of intent against each of the themes and the priorities. I I'm not going to read those out specifically, but they're on uh, the screen for colleagues to, to sort of review. And I think the slides will be sent out afterwards. But what I did want to highlight is just a few of the activities that, that underpin the priorities and that explain perhaps where we want to go with the activity that um, we want to do under this civic university agreement banner. So for instance, on, on education and, and skills, um, we talk about helping to make our region the best area in the country for young people to grow up uh, and for people of all ages to be able to access qualifications. So this means like working on things that perhaps we already do, for instance, through the GM Higher Collaboration Network on Outreach, but also looking at new avenues and new partnerships to offer education and skills pathways for people in Greater Manchester. So, for instance, in Greater Manchester, we have signed a joint MOU between all of the higher education institutions and further edu education colleges that commits us to um, working together to improve those pathways. Um, take Next Zero as well, for instance. Um, I think all of the universities have signed up to the Greater Manchester ambition or target to be net zero by 2038. But we're also active partners in other structures within the city region, such as the uh, Green City Region Partnership, <clears throat> which drives activity between a whole host of stakeholders um, to deliver on the environmental ambitions of the GMCA and the city region mayor, Andy Burnham. And we're also all, I think, the university is part of a new innova uh, energy innovation agency, which is looking to um, really drill down into how do we reach that 2038 target. 
um, digital economy. Um, we're active participants in a number of initiatives that are about encouraging SMEs and businesses to adopt new digital technologies. So the AI foundry uh, and the cyber foundry are two such examples. And again, on the uh, jobs and growth <clears throat> ambition, you can see there in that bottom right hand box, how we've distilled that is uh, we want to support the levelling up of opportunities and life chances between Greater Manchester and the rest of the UK. But also importantly, between the most and least disadvantaged towns and districts of Greater Manchester. And one of the projects that we're working on is something called Innovation GM, uh, which is a £7 billion blueprint for how R&D and investment in R&D in Greater Manchester can tackle some of the uh, regional disparity we see in our own city region. Um, so, for instance, we are focusing on how can R&D and innovation be developed in areas like Bury and Rochdale to drive the economy and create jobs there. Next slide, please. To uh, deliver on these uh, ambitions and these priorities, and let's face it, it wouldn't be uh, higher education without a good governance structure, um, we put a lot of thought into how we actually bring together the right people to drive forward activity, but also I think importantly have uh, accountability both within our own institutions uh, as universities or, or higher education providers, and critically, because we are partnered with the GMCA, which, um, as we've mentioned, is, is actually 10 local authorities. So 10 local authorities with 10 uh, individual leaders or, uh, in the case of Salford, a city mayor. And then the mayor of Greater Manchester, Andy Burnham, we were conscious that um, we wanted to produce a governance structure that would um, help ease the pathways between those various uh, organisations. But as I say, add some accountability. So I hope this slide sort of makes sense. But... At the top there, you've got VC slash principles group. So I think Michael referred to it earlier on in the presentation. But during COVID, the vice chancellors and principal of the five institutions in Greater Manchester were actually meeting, I think, weekly. Um, this is now down to fortnightly. Um, sort of informal, semi-formal, semi-informal, um, but very much collaborative and looking at ways in which the universities could work together to address the immediate um, issues relating to COVID. Now, we didn't want to create a whole new structure um, that would take away from the existing um, forum in which the vice chancellors meet. So that's our kind of overarching group. And underneath it, we've created a Greater Manchester Civic University Board. And that will be the main um, place in which discussion and activity will take place to deliver on the ambitions that, that I've outlined already. And what you can see just off that Civic University Board is then university internal committees and GMCA committees. So just in recognition that um, the board uh, and the membership of the board is not the only kind of people that will be involved in this. So if we just have the next slide, please, Shireen. So just to explain what I mean by the uh, Greater Manchester Civic University Board, uh, this is just a breakdown of the membership. Um, so we've gone for one senior academic representative of each uh, HEI, one senior professional service uh, representative from each HEI, a senior officer from the Greater Manchester Combined Authority, and one elected member of the uh, Greater Manchester Combined Authority, uh, and then a chair and a deputy chair, which are elected annually, uh, and they come from the uh, Higher Education Institute ac uh, academic representation. And we felt that this membership structure offered um, a fair balance between, of course, all of the uh, six partners when you break it down as the five universities and, and the GMCA, but also brought that balance of, of academic involvement and also democratic involvement by way of the elected member of the GMCA. And we're also having some early discussions around how we can perhaps bring in the student voice into this uh, governance structure, as well as uh, continue that civic engagement and, and bring the more uh, local and community voice through um, you know, as we've already demonstrated through the polling, but actually then bring that to life uh, in the day-to-day -day governance. And then next slide, please. Just finally, I thought I'd give people a sort of understanding of where we're up to because we are in really early days. Um, we launched the agreement in September. Uh, we had to go through the formal processes of the GMCA. It was approved uh, technically by the 10 leaders of the local authorities and um, the Greater Manchester Mayor. Um, and we had the first meeting of the board just before Christmas um, in December 2021. And the focus really was on priority setting. So we've got <clears throat> the six themes, we've got the statement of intent, 
how do we then make that real? And importantly, how do we measure um, what we are doing and the impact of what we are doing and what's the action plan that underpins that? Um, so as I say, very early days, the board will meet quarterly uh, with meetings in between, hopefully to really drive some progress and, and deliver on those ambitions um, and perhaps prove uh, the gentleman we were talking about earlier, uh, who's written in one uh, HE, uh, that this is meaningful. This is not a PR exercise. Um, we do want to make a difference to the communities that, that we proudly represent. Um, so I'll leave it there. Look forward to questions. Thank you. Great. <clears throat> Thank you so much. And um, fantastic to get such a good overview of, of what's been going on. And um, we've already got a, a couple of questions coming through in chat that I'll turn to in a second. It's just so, something, Julian, that I remember talking to you a couple of years ago and there was quite lukewarm enthusiasm for civic agreements um, back then. I just wondered what, what changed? Yeah, for, for us, um, when there was an opportunity to take forward a civic university agreement, we really liked the approach and we were very much part of the, we hosted actually one of Lord Kerslake's evidence sessions in Manchester and um, thought it was a great idea. I think, um, and I've, I've said this, I think Greg's on the call and we, we, we fed this back. We had a few days notice really to, to say we were going to sign up and we felt to do this. We wanted to do this properly, to have the time for those conversations, to be more bottom up, to consider, to talk to elected leaders. This wasn't just a, a university process. This was something we wanted to engage, as Charlotte's mentioned, elected leaders with. So we feel we've got something now, which is ours, even though it's uh, following uh, something that Lord Kerslake would say, you know, in terms of the principles being strategic, being informed by um, the outside world. So it's a question of time and, and owning this ourselves rather than being just following what somebody asked us to do. And I think, as you can see, hopefully that's the right decision, really. This is a long game we're trying to play, of course. Yeah, great. And that, I think, is the theme that our colleagues in London will pick up about the development time it takes to do this well. Um, I wondered, um, uh, Charlotte and Michael, whether you had any any answers for for Michael, who asks a really thoughtful question. Uh, Michael uh, Goldsmith saying, "How has the reception of the Civic University Agreement been at the universities um, with academics at Goldsmiths? We've had a mixed response with some very positive engagement and some civic washing type skepticism." Yeah, uh, from our point of view, um, it's it's been overwhelmingly positive, if I'm honest. Um, and the response I've got from academics when I've gone to various forums and consulted is really pleased that we're doing it, really pleased that there's an ambition to it. But what's great is it's, I think it makes academics to think about the work they do and how it, how it also affects them. So it's making them think, and we've had lots of practical suggestions about the work they're doing and how that can relate to that. Almost an embarrassment of riches in a way. But I think it's been a really good exercise for them to think about the context of the work they do in relation yeah. to the, uni the university and the community. But also okay. it helps get a sense from them in a way that we otherwise wouldn't have always about how their work can either be adapted, scaled up, or at least put into the context of something bigger than just the, the, the work they do in their own area. I don't know how Charlotte yeah. feels, but that, I haven't had any negativity to date, if I'm honest. Charlotte, how about you? Yeah, I, I, it's broadly the same answer. I mean, at Salford, um, there's quite a spirit of collaboration and partnership and trying to make things real um, for the local community and the wider city region. And I think there's a lot of natural activity that the academics are already doing that. I think the way Michael said it, it, it almost puts it in a bigger context that kind of institutionally backs that, you know, if you're going out doing work, um, that supports people in, in Salford or across Greater Manchester, that actually this is something that the, the university values. So, yeah, I, I haven't had too much uh, scepticism, uh, I must admit, but, but lots of enthusiasm. Um, right. And certainly, yeah, as, as Michael says, you know, an embarrassment of riches. Uh, I think part of the next phase of work will be really getting under the skin of what is happening and what, what is already going on because you know on a very regular basis I'll talk to academic colleagues and go wow I just did not know you were doing that and that's absolutely brilliant and we should be shouting about it a lot more. Great and I guess I think some of us might be feeling a bit intimidated almost by the scale and the ambition and and the success that that you have achieved uh, and thinking oh, you know yeah almost sort of slightly overwhelmed by by that, I'm just. What is it about 
Manchester, Greater Manchester. What what are the conditions that have helped you achieve so much? Um, are there things about Manchester that that it would help us to understand uh, because they've given you a context and and given you almost a head start? You mean apart yeah. from being the best city region in the world? Or, um... Yeah, I've heard that. No, before, it is. Actually. No, I think there's something. I I think it's a really good question about why the GM. I think we're quite fortunate that there's the the LEP the um, is coterminous with a combined authority, coterminous with a mayor, uh, and builds on a few decades of collaboration. You know, the only part of the country that's got a devolved health budget of six billion pounds a year. There's a lot of, um, and people in London would say, you know, that the, the governance in Greater Manchester, whilst behind the scenes, of course, there's a lot of um, discussion and debate. What we present uh, to the rest of the country is quite a joined up system. And I think you could see that in, you know, Andy Burnham's famous speech alongside mm -hmm. Sir Richard Lees and others on the steps of, um, of, of the town hall during lockdown, you know, arguing um, about some of the national policies. So I think there's a tradition in Greater Manchester of collaboration, which the universities are part of, but also benefit from. I mean, uh, Charlotte's a local councillor herself and is an elected person. And I think I think that's an interesting perspective as well. For us, that was really important. Wherever you are in the country, nobody's elected, you know, ahead of public engagement or civic engagement to do anything. In terms of accountability, um, we've got local MPs and we've got local councillors. And I think that's a really important dynamic to this as well that we tried to be true to and however small or big your agreement is I think that principle is a really interesting theme to come out of today yeah yeah I mean I just just I think all of that's true what I said in my remarks about you know the five institutions whose student population but in that slide that I put up there's a number of policy documents there there's just a sense here I think in Greater Manchester that there's a lot going on on the big strategic issues and I think people shouldn't be intimidated by that in the sense that, you know, if, if you're on the same page as your civic partner in terms of what the themes are, it becomes a much easier task then to match up the traditional strengths and role of a university with their agenda. And I think if you look at the six themes that we've settled on, frankly, most institutions and most civic partners would have a version of those. I mean, they're the ones that are confronting the nation now. So I think rather than be intimidated by it, I think it's more it's more of an inspiration or a challenge in many ways, because we, yeah. you know, as institutions, we do have a really significant contribution. And a really good example of that is, you know, you talked about the civic washing thing and Jonathan Grant's piece. So, you know, not only are the, un the universities here today, you know, we're living wage partners, but also, you know, one of our research centres, the Decent Work and Productivity Centre, actually did the research for the combined authority to frame their own good Manchester, uh, sorry, Greater Manchester Good Employment Charter. So as well as being you know, dragged along by the civic agenda, in many ways, we're using what we're good at as institutions to contribute to it and put a stamp on it. So I think, you know, I say, I don't think it's about being intimidated. I think it's more about being inspired, you know, in many ways. Can just, I just, just add, add on that point? Yeah. Sorry, Paul, to interrupt, but... No, go on. Um, and I, and I know that this forum is, you know, hopefully uh, a place to be honest. So I think just to pick up on the challenge point, you know, we have gone ambitious with a scale of, of 10 local authorities, 2.8 million people, something like 51 towns, I think Julian's uh, mentioned in, in Greater Manchester. Um, and, and we have to deliver on that. So, you know, rather than sort of wanting to sit here and say it's absolutely brilliant, you know, it's kind of we've now got to get into delivery phase. So just as a sort of reflection from my own institution, um, we, we struggle enough sometimes with, with our own local councillors and, and, and getting them bought into to, to what we do. Uh, we changed our logo from uh, University of Salford, a Greater Manchester University to University of Salford, Man uh, Manchester about a decade ago. And we still get it in the neck because people think we don't care about Salford. Um, so we recognise that challenge that is in our immediate backyard to um, explain and ensure that local stakeholders understand our role in the community and our commitment to that community. But likewise, I think the challenge we've set through this Greater Manchester Civic University is to also recognise that we do have a role to play in <coughs> You know, areas across the city region that say, for example, are perhaps higher, higher education cold spots. You know, Julian talked about those levels of pride amongst certain communities in the local universities. And you can see a kind of pattern of what well, that is places that perhaps 
that are um, not doing as well economically or don't have that access or feel like they have that access. So um, it is exciting and it is an inspiration, but we have set ourselves a challenge. Um, so I think, yeah, watch this space, um, I would say to people looking and sort of uh, being terrified of how you know fantastically we've done because we've got a long way to go. And I think to pick up on that point, and, and Julian, we, we discussed it, I think around, you know, we have got five higher education institutions and, and the combined authority. And, you know, there are a lot of different opinions um, on what we should do. And so we are, we have perhaps in the grandness, there is a lack of absolute specificity, but we recognize that. And that's the challenge that we want to address uh, and build on. And I think, you know, I've, I've noticed a couple of questions in chat that we might come back to later. I might just leave this with you to, to ponder a little bit. How will you know, that you are succeeding you know what kinds of measures and kpis are, are you going to put in place that will enable you to demonstrate to yourselves that you are making the kind of progress you want because i guess there is a risk that with such a kind of high level approach uh, it, it's not civic wash exactly but it's so broad and expansive that it could be hard to operationalize so maybe later we can come back to you and, and ask you about that uh, but i sense charlotte you had something you wanted to say immediately Maybe yeah, well, for me, and um, as I said in my part of the presentation, we are at the uh, very early stages and this is part of the work to do. But one of the benefits of the partners that we have through the GMCA is that really strong uh, understanding of what the region wants to achieve. Yeah. Uh, so the combined authority and the mayor have just signed off um, a sort of updated Greater Manchester strategy. That in itself has a lot of very clear um, sort of KPIs, deliverables and action plans. So part of it, I think, is about slotting into that. You know, we're not yeah. going to come up with our own set of this is what good looks like if Greater Manchester as a, as a conurbation, um, as a sort of political body has its own um, very clear aspirations. But I think it's then about being um, boiling it down to then what within that is the role of the civic university agreement, the board, the partners, yeah. because universities can't be all things to all people there are some things that we can help and support with and there are some things that are just not our bag and we have to be honest and realistic about that perfect what a brilliant answer and if you could put a link charlotte maybe to some of those those kind of um agreements that have been struck i think colleagues would be really interested to see those but um and thank you everyone for the questions that are coming through in chat we picked up on some of them we'll come back to them later but also julian particularly thank you for for picking those up and and, and responding to them in the chat as well but let's um let's go let's go south to london now and um and welcome our team uh from from east london uh, to share their work with us. Um, we've got Sophie, Emily and Gail, and we're going to do this a bit differently. We're going to do it rather than as a presentation, more as a conversation um, to reflect on the work that they've been doing. But maybe first of all, could I just um, maybe start with you, Sophie, just for a quick introduction as to who you are, and where you work, and then I'll, if you could pass um, to Emily, and then if Emily could pass to Gail, just so that we know who we, who we are. No problem. Hi, and thanks very much for having us today. Uh, I'm Sophie Klauspark. I'm the Director of London Engagement and also the London Met Lab in Power in London at London Met University. So no guesses where I'm from. Um, and I'm going to pass you over to Emily. Thanks, Sophie. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Emily. I'm Director of the Centre for Public Engagement at Queen Mary University of London. And uh, we're the team who support and enable public, community and civic engagement across Queen Mary. And I will pass to Gail. Good morning, everybody. Thanks, Emily. Um, my name is Gail May. Um, my job title is the Director of the Office for Postgraduate Research and Engagement at the University of East London. So we have um, civic engagement, public engagement within that, and we are also the research support function as well as supporting our PGR students. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Gail. And Towards the end of the session, we'll, there'll be a chance to sort of draw the threads together um, across the two the two projects. But we're going to deep dive deeply now into East London, and I wondered, Emily, if you could just sort of start by almost setting the scene for us and kind of helping us understand the sort of the place in which you're working and and the sort of nature of the collaboration that you've been involved in. 
Yeah, of course. Thanks, Paul. And I think, Shireen, if you've got a slide for me, that would be brilliant as well. This is very rough, uh, just to set the context in the background. So, uh, so as Sophie Gale and I mentioned, we're all based at universities in East London, but sort of you can see here's London as a whole uh, split by boroughs. So we're talking about roughly give or take nine million people. Um, our three universities are based in East London, uh, which, again, you can argue a little bit about which boroughs, but essentially you've got this part here that's surrounded by blue, which is approximately 2 million people. Um, and as three universities, we work well across all of London, but particularly with boroughs across all of East London. I'm just going to pop into the chat in case anyone hasn't seen it. Um, London Higher developed a, uh, a civic map recently, sort of highlighting some civic activity that was happening across London boroughs, just to sort of illustrate, I guess, um, the amount of work going on and, and the complexity of it and, and how, how universities are working um, across uh, individual boroughs. But today what we wanted to talk about was uh, Tower Hamlets, um, which is a single borough within, uh, within those there, uh, circled there in yellow, which is approximately 320,000 people. Um, and uh, as three universities, we have all been involved with conversations with Tower Hamlets. You know, if I take Queen Mary, for example, uh, we have worked with Tower Hamlets Council uh, for many, many years. Um, several of our campuses are based within the borough. So that means kind of having a strong relationship with the mayor, uh, being part of different committees and working groups, um, sharing our priorities, linking our academics, particular pieces of research, etc. But we found um, uh, we, you know, we, we were in a lot of conversations and I think through the process of developing an agreement, which we haven't published, launched yet, but we will be doing in a few months time. Um, what we wanted to do was, was bring a, a bit of a framework around that and a bit of structure to the way that we were interacting, um, particularly with Tower Hamlets, but hopefully uh, our ambition would be to spread that across other boroughs. Um, and I think it was, to be really clear, our purpose working together as three universities so far has not been to develop an East London civic agreement. That may be where it goes in the future. Um, and, you know, I would agree Greater Manchester's work is incredibly inspirational. But where we wanted to start with was just to uh, bring a bit of cohesion to the conversations that each university was having within Tower Hamlets and to try and create um, or try and build more of a, a front door or a face to higher education for people working within Tower Hamlets. So they understood that they could come to one of us and that that, that conversation would be passed on. They didn't, you know... It, just to, to create a bit more simplicity uh, for the borough was our, was has been our purpose up to now. Great. What a fantastic introduction. And um, maybe, Sophie or Gail, you'd like to just sort of pick up on the story from, from the perspective of your, of your university. Shall I pick up, um, Gail? So, yeah, just at the beginning, I think it's interesting how it started. As um, Emily said, all of us have been working with Tower Hamlets in different ways for a number of years. And Emily and ourselves, our universities had sites in Tower Hamlets as well. So we'd had to be dealing from that side of thing as well. Um, I think our connection actually started when I started my role uh, two years ago. Um, I already knew Gail from a long time ago and we were doing the same thing. And I met Emily through another colleague um, and I thought it'd be good if we could all get together and have a chat. Um, which is where it literally started, a very informal chat, just the three of us um, bouncing things off each other uh, to see where it might go. And I think we realised in that first chat that actually having people at other unis who do the same job as you is a really good place to have a place to bounce things off to each other. So not only were we bouncing things off each other about Town Hamlets, we were bouncing things off each other in general about the work that we were doing, um, which I think we all felt very useful as well. Um, from that, I think the beginning, please, one of you jump in if I'm wrong. The first thing we did together was go to a meeting, which was the local Silver Economy Recovery Group meeting, um, which now is called their Growth and Economic Development Partnership, which we're all still part of. Um, and I think that was the beginning um, of where we started talking with the council of how we can work, particularly with it, it was particularly we were looking at the recovery after COVID to begin with, but that as we've gone along has spread out to more things. Gail, I don't know if you want to carry on from there. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, well, just to say that this is an informal collaboration and we wanted to come early to sort of 
share that we're not at the um, Greater Manchester um, part of the journey, but I think um, just to add context to what Emily and Sophie have said is that we wanted to share some of this in, these very initial ways of working because we thought they might be valuable um, to others who may be looking at a, a starting point that um, I remember sitting in various networks going that's amazing that they've done that and got to that point how did how did they start so I think just to kind of come back to that you know the purpose and how we started is I think then the three of us have spent the last few months probably six months or so starting to listen very carefully to the needs as articulated by the local authority and wider through the partnership group that we're a member of. We've started to um, articulate what some of our responses might be as individual universities or as, is there a theme emerging here that actually there might be opportunities to collaborate? So I wouldn't say we have even necessarily identified the core areas for collaboration, but we have started to think those through, to articulate them, to be able to um, respond to, I think what Tower Hamlets were looking for was that sort of single point of contact into a group of local universities and then into the individual universities so that they can bring us, do you do this? How do you do this? How does that work? Um, so I think that's, that, that's the place that I feel that we have been at for the last few months is beginning to help universities and our local authority un understand each other, um, but also to share some practice around the three universities, which has been enormously valuable. And I can't underestimate that sort of um, element of the purpose and, and why we've been doing this. Yeah. If I could add in there as well, I think one of the things that the council have found valuable is as we've all said, is that we're already all working with them. Um, but they didn't realise how much opportunity they had for their residents. So in a couple of the early conversations, they'd be like, oh, we really wish the unis could do this. And one of us would be like, but we do. And then they'd be like, we really wish they could do this. And they'd be like, but we do. So one of the very first things we did as a three organisations was we got together information on what services we provide as unis for skills and young people, uh, for employment support and sm um, small business support, what clinics we had that their local residents could access and some of our art and community other work that we're doing as three years. And we put that together into a single PDF with links that anyone in the council could just have a look at and straight away they know everything that's available. And I think they were quite shocked how much when you actually saw it all one place, how much it did. Um, and I think that was really, really valuable for us as well to make us realise how much we were doing as well, because it made us as civic leads go away and find out what is going on at the uni at the moment, what is happening. Um, I think, as Gail also pointed to, it was the collaboration point of view, which I think we might come on to later, is one of the things that has come out of it is a big collaborative bid that hopefully will lead on to more as well. Great. It's a sort of really interesting thread across both presentations about how you kind of connect to local communities and but also to local kind of democratic structures in order to develop a, a real authentic democratic mandate for for the work that you're doing um, and you know that's that's wonderful to see um, but I guess that must be quite hard to to sort of to, to get find that sweet spot where you are really both listening to local politicians, but also listening to local residents and local citizens. And I wondered what lessons you'd learned about how to get that authentic, democratic kind of connection. Maybe if I start and then Sophie and Gal, if you want to jump in, because I guess from Queen Mary's perspective, we've sort of, we've been developing, or I've been developing my relationship with Sophie and Gail and, and the way that we present ourselves to Tower Hamlets at the same time as we've been developing our civic agreement. So the agreement has been um, a process, an engaged process of working with local community groups, local charities, local residents across East London, but a, a high proportion in Tower Hamlets to um, co-develop our the priorities and the themes of our agreement together is the reason we haven't published it yet because that 
process has been longer and, and messier than we anticipated as engagement often is. But it's been really interesting to do that alongside because I think it's a, a sense check of what's coming out as in terms of priorities for local residents and then what's coming out of the council. And I think as Ma our colleagues from Manchester touched on, often the themes are the same. You know, when you get down to the details, that that is when we, we might start moving in different directions. But but often often it is about a more prosperous, safe um a borough that 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 people want to live in and that people can thrive in um and are healthy within and you know so so i think that it's the details that, that start to change but it's been really interesting doing that at the same time um and i think one thing that's helped is us having we're a friendly face for and we can have those honest conversations so even if there is a lot of chaos behind closed doors when 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 certain things are happening either at the university or the council end particularly over the last two years with covid you have someone that you can come to and have that really honest candid conversation about where you want to get to and what's really important so if you can gail i wondered if you wanted to to add anything to that yeah, I think, as we were saying, this particular Tower Hamlets one is we're looking at actual activity and not the democratic votes because we're all doing our work behind the scenes that we're not doing together, if that makes sense. So um, I think that is something we'll look at further down the line. I mean, part like the London um, Pacific Uni map as well that we were looking at earlier, that's us linking as a wider um, but all of us are doing stuff. I'm not doing it in Tower Hamlets. I'm doing it in Islington at the moment because we're becoming an anchor institution. Um, and we are part of their Let's Talk Islington where we are going out and actually talking to um, residents um, without the council. And we've actually already had feedback because what we've done is used our students to go and talk to the residents. And they've loved that. And the residents have actually fed back that they preferred that and talking to the council or talking to our academics, which I thought was really interesting. And I think we'll pull that into the kind of work mm -hmm. we do, but we're looking at a more case by case of the projects we're working on, I think, in Tower Hamlets as well. Um, and we're looking at how we bring our academics in. And I think that goes back to some of the questions earlier about how do academics feel about this? And I think we were all actually surprised after how we've worked with academics in the past, how easily it was to pull them in on some of this mm. stuff that we've been doing jointly. Um, I had the academics bite my arm off to come to a couple of meetings. Mm. And I think that was something that was really surprising from my point of view. Um, I'm back in the day, outreach is my main thing and it's really hard to get academics involved. So to suddenly see them biting your arm up to turn up to these things because they can see how it really their research can really affect change and really affect policy change, which I think is something a lot of academics really want to happen. And it's very grassroots, but it still can end up with policy change. Um, Gail, did you want to add? Just a very small point, really. I, I would agree that there's a huge appetite in our academic community to engage. and We have a, a history and track record of strong engagement and co-production with communities, with voluntary and community sector. For us at the moment, I think what's quite challenging is I would agree with Sophie, we're trying to look at how we how voices and views and opinions come through work, come through a range of different networks, come through. We've had some uh, semi formal community consultation groups over the last year, but we haven't done a survey yet and I'm really interested in where um, organizations groups have come together to do those surveys and I know that um, Emily shared the results of the work that they'd done for their civic agreement and yes the themes were very similar to the ones that um, Manchester have shown us this morning um, so we're weighing that up at the moment in terms of um, through the work that we've done, we identified six themes a couple of years ago, which are very similar to those that have been um, shared um, this morning. So we're, yeah, we're weighing about how do you reach uh, communities, um, residents, so that they can have a, a meaningful feed into priorities and also ways of working as well. To, to what extent are you able to engage and then check back in Mm. at various points I don't have any um answers to that just you lots of questions yeah and I think you you were keen that we didn't just look at what's working well but you were also keen to reflect on some of the challenges the bumps in the road um that you've experienced to date and and how you've dealt with those I don't know whether we could turn to that briefly and uh, maybe start Emily with with you on that one I think you know 
resort I know people always bring it up but resource this stuff you know this is hard and relationships are time and energy intensive particularly to maintain and to, to build trust over time and um you know looking at Manchester's incredible work I would fall over if I had to have individual conversations with another eight London boroughs on top of what we've done in Tower Hamlet so I think I have a I have a fear of sort of how we reach beyond how we how we build that relationship across East London and that actually the approach we've taken here of that kind of bottom up grassroots being an indiv- you know a face a person that people can reach out and ask questions to probably does need to shift into something um, more like Manchester's approach actually if we wanted to go across East London it, it would be really challenging to, to scale um, so that's probably been one of my biggest ones is sort of the responsiveness and the time it takes for this kind of stuff. I would add to that. I totally agree with what you said, Emily. But what I would say is the three of us working together has taken some of that pressure off because there's like, for example, the meeting that I spoke about earlier, I used to go myself. Now we sort of take it in turns, don't we? There's never all three of us there. And we just report back to each other. And we, when we're at those meetings, we're the university's voice as opposed to our individual unis voices and that has taken some pressure off um but like emily says yeah if we were to 30 boroughs in london it is not we couldn't you know there's no way you could feasibly do this kind of work like that um but i do think it's a good starting point okay um i think for me um it's it's the challenge really of where we are now and I think it's the interesting juxtaposition of um, Greater Manchester having reached the point that they've reached in their journey and us coming much earlier in that journey at which point do you move from working civically to the civic agreement and um, how do you start to um, weigh up the East London versus separate local authority agreements, which universities might you work with in different uh, patches and different overlay. And I think the other thing for us is, I think Emily, Sophie and I agree on our version of East London, but that's not the, um, that's not the way it's sub-regionally organized. So it, that doesn't even, um, that doesn't even line up either. But I think, yeah, I think one of our challenges now is uh, we, Do we continue working civically and in this informal collaboration? And when do we start to think about, well, do things need to move to a more formal pace? I would also just add that we have tried to style ourselves as being single point of contact for our universities. So single point of contact together and then for our universities. um, And that becomes a different kind of resourcing issue. That's not just a resourcing of a civic agreement type work. It's a capacity issue around, it's uh, it's welcomed, I think, that we can be that role, but uh, how much more can we do that without having a more formal mm. structure and a set of priorities, I would yeah. say. Great, thank you. And <clears throat> again, please, if you've got questions uh, for the London team, please do pop them in chat. But I mean, I, I'm immediately interested, Gail, in how how are you going to decide how to address that really difficult question? What, what process are you going to use to resolve that? Um, I think uh, this will be interesting. This is an interesting point for us because I think sharing this work in this, in this network, I'm looking forward to, to questions um, that, that, that will come out of this and our opportunity to reflect. I think we probably are at a point where we need to consider those next steps now, partly because um, we'll be working with somebody different. I don't know if I can say this, Emily, that you're going on to a different role. So it it becomes a point, I think, of trying to capture the work that we've done with Emily in this role um, and think about as Emily is is moving on what those next steps might be. I think it's probably going to bring a formal decision making point a bit earlier than we might have um necessarily um thought about but i have to say we haven't really discussed those next steps yeah. as a team so my, my colleagues may have very different very different views on that i agree with you gail i do think it's a really good point for that and i think there's one other thing i just wanted to throw in that's making it difficult with civic uni agreements is that quite a few london councils now are starting anchor university agreements for their boroughs yeah. which are exactly the same I mean mm-hmm. it's it's exactly the same to the extent one we're working with we just decide we call it whoever wants to call it what they want but they want individual borough anchor agreements 
Um, so what's been really interesting is that's bringing in, I saw earlier someone was asking about the NHS and it is bringing in the NHS and housing providers and other things. But then it is, does the uni do a whole one for London or do you do one for each borough? And then how does that work when we're working together as well? I think is some of the issues as well. Um, yeah. Think about. yeah, great. Um, just sort of moving to a sort of wrap up in, of, of, of this sort of panel, I wondered if there was anything finally that, that each, each of you wanted to say in terms of a key learning point or a key challenge or, or provocation almost to the rest of us. I guess to wrap up from my perspective, as Gail mentioned, I'm I'm leaving soon. Um, and so I'm thinking about kind of where this goes what goes next from Queen Mary's perspective, which has made me reflect quite a lot on um, the role of individual people in civic and, and public engagement, actually, and how you make sure that work continues and that there is a transition. We do have a civic engagement lead starting in a few months, though, so that, that is good news. It definitely will continue. Um, and I think the challenge of uh, developing a university agreement within your institution while you uh, are engaging with other universities and how you how you order your step how you get everything in the right order at what point you bring them in where you can flex and where you can't I think has been really um, interesting but I think it can be difficult and it's different it's different for every university that will be on this call as well and I just wanted to pick up there was a question in the chat about UCL and it's a it's a really good point we, we are not the only three universities in East London um, and as Gail mentioned if we're thinking about sort of where we take this work next and how we build it from the conversations the three of us are having um, it wouldn't be particularly civic of us uh, to to not think about how we um, involve other universities within East London. So I guess this would be, a, as I'm leaving, an invite mm -hmm. <laughs> for, for other universities in East London to get, to get involved and help us to think about um, where we go next. And I think we might have lost Paul for a second. So okay. I will hand over to you, Gail. <laughs> I was going to say, I was just kind of going to come in and say something about um, the exercise that we've been through has really I think helped us to build trust and understanding amongst um, us as a group of practitioners um, and I um, I was the, the third member to join and was in, invited in by, by Sophie and Emily and I just think the openness the knowledge sharing the sharing of frameworks the sharing of this is how we've done this thing in another borough in another place um, you know has been hugely valuable um, and there's something about going into some of this exploratory work with with an openness and a, and I think this space has enabled us to build trust um, to kind of further open and, and share some of the ways of doing things and share the challenges um, amongst ourselves as well and, and reflect on those. Great. Thank you, Gail. Sophie, anything, any sort of final important points you'd like to... I think they've summed everything up yeah. you know, perfectly. But I think the biggest takeaway for me is this works a lot easier when you're working with others, even down to the fact that when all the asks are there and you might not be able to cover them, you've got other people to say, can you help out? Um, but I, I'm very much for collaborative work in this arena and not working as individual universities. Great, wonderful. Uh, in a minute, I'll, I'll go back to colleagues in, um, in Manchester and invite them to to kind of reflect almost on what they've heard. I suspect they may have some, some thoughts or questions for you, but I just saw a really interesting comment, a uh, question from Ben uh, in the chat, um, where he asks about with these sorts of grassroots approaches, what engagement have you had with ethics at your institutions? Um, and I just wondered whether that was something that you had taken on and thought through. I think it's a really good point, Ben. Um, and I guess in terms of how we've worked so far, um, Gail and Sophie, correct me if I'm wrong, in terms of the way that our three, the three of us have worked together so far, we haven't involved kind of our ethics committees internally or, or brought kind of ethics into the conversations of how we engage with the London borough of Tower Hamlets. Um, what I can say about our agreement is that um, because we have involved 
local residents and stakeholders in a series of prioritization workshops um, and sort of sense making co-analysis uh, events with us. We did reach out and ask the Institute of Community Studies to support us with that as a, they came along and they've been uh, helping uh, develop our agreement with us because they have such expertise in kind of really high quality community involvement. Um, and recently, about a few months ago now, we reached out to our ethics committee and asked if someone from the Centre for Public Engagement can always sit on it so we sort of developed a new link there just to try and bring a bit of uh, insight back into the CP and the advice we're giving the advice we're giving and vice versa I think how we involve ethics in our civic agreement going forward so how we support academics with the civic work that they're doing or support um, professional services teams who perhaps previously have never um, engaged with the local community I think will be a really interesting question um, and and a new one for us Thank you. Cool. So maybe Shireen, you could bring up, um, we could bring up everyone's video from the two teams who, who presented to us today. And I just wanted to, to just go back to colleagues in Manchester and, and you've been bigged up a bit by our colleagues in London who, is, who have been very, very complimentary about, about the approach and that you've taken. I wondered if you had any reflections on what you've heard about what's happening in London uh, and, and any questions for the teams there. Um, I'm happy to have a go. Uh, and I think it, it, just thanks to colleagues in London, I thought that was really interesting. And I think what it shows, a bit like the last session we had where we heard from Sheffield Hallam, uh, which was a fascinating presentation, uh, I thought as well, there's different ways of doing this on different levels. I mean, my next meeting where I go from here is to talk about a project we have in one ward in Manchester with nine, I just Googled a population of 19,000 people in Ardwick, where our university is located. And I think the sorts of things we can do in that one ward in one local authority is very different to what you can do across Greater Manchester. There's different ways, I think, of, of thinking about this. And, and certainly the advantage of, there's lots of advantages of the approach the colleagues in London have taken compared to what we've got across Greater Manchester. And the thing that struck me, probably more of a contrast really, was the, the, the last session with that Sheffield Hallam one. I was thinking it's such a different approach to Greater Manchester. You know, one institution which can have a much greater degree of specificity with very clear accountable actions in one institution where you can be more agile, more accountable, more exact. When you're doing more partnership work, I think what's common from the London colleagues and, and the Greater Manchester colleagues today is when you're in any type of partnership, there are upsides and downsides. And I think one of the downsides inevitably is the time it takes to develop these relationships. We could have all signed off agreements much quicker in the long run, though, I think these, the, these partnerships do create different types of opportunities. I mean, Michael said a phrase earlier that um, I think really sums up, uh, and it's exactly what I heard from the London colleagues as well, about the di um, having differences as a strength. Um, and I think within the three London institutions, within the, the, the five in Greater Manchester, you can do and be and research and teach almost anything. And I think that's wonderful when those institutions can can work together. So there's there's a lot in common, but I think there is this trade-off between specificity and speed, which you can have when one institution does something and that partnership, which inevitably takes a bit longer and has to start at a higher level and will involve more compromise. But I think what we, we, we're we certainly inspired by the London colleagues about what some of the sorts of things we can do next once we get that degree of specificity. Yeah. Great. Just on that, I mean, I, I, yeah, just another great example of how you have to do things differently with with the circumstances you face. But the one thing I would say, and it's sort of something that Charlotte said, which is, you know, regardless of the civic partner, regardless of the circumstances and all the rest of it, you know, you, you will make a contribution through these agreements, but you have to you have to know what you're good at, what your strengths are and what your role is. And I know my own vice chancellor keeps saying, you know, happy to be part of this, but, you know, let's not sign up for things that we're not responsible for. And let's do the things we're good at and make the contributions where they're actually telling and, and, and add value. And I think that's that danger of mission creep is actually quite quite present in, in, all, in everyone's journey, regardless of how they get there. You know, so but the, the question I have for you guys was, you know, if you had your time again, what would you do differently? I'd have started the conversations earlier. <laughs> I think we, um, I definitely, I was in the same rooms with Sophie or we were forwarding things to our vice chancellors. Can your vice chancellor meet with our vice chancellor about this? And then Sophie finally said, shall we have a chat? <laughs> and I wish we'd done that earlier. Um, and I, I think it would have it it would have helped us think about how we involve universities in the development of our agreement as well. Um, if we had done, would be mine.
I, I mean, I do agree. It would have been good to start this this earlier. Um, but what I'm also thinking of is um, thank you, everybody, for listening to us, because this has been a hugely helpful, reflective um, uh, opportunity for us. And I think the challenge we've heard is what next? And I think we knew we were going to get that challenge when we thought, well, let's come and take something that's only very early stages. Um, and I think that is the key thing for us now is that we should be and probably we should have started this maybe a little bit earlier in terms of handover from Emily into new colleagues that are coming in and how we can uh, yeah use this as a moment to pause and think about mm. next steps. Yeah. I'm kind of um, interested Charlotte in, in your reflections too any things that, that, that struck you? Yeah, I think that I think it was Emily. Sorry, I don't know who said this, but sort of the idea of talking to like eight different boroughs was kind of giving her heart palpitations. Um, and my just reflection was, I think we're very lucky in Greater Manchester to have the structure that, that we do. So we predominantly developed this agreement through the GMCA um, and officers working for the GMCA who then did the job of uh, briefing uh, local leaders and cajoling them into uh, agreeing this uh, at, the, at the formal meeting of the combined authority. But then the reflection is also back on, oh, aren't, you know, aren't we smug? Because that was really straightforward. But actually, is there a deficit there that we're not getting to know those individuals and um, doing that sort of uh, deeper engagement and not just relying on the combined authority? Um, because the combined authority is not necessarily all of the local councils, if that makes sense, even though each council leader uh, sits on it. So um, that's, I think, one for us to, to take away and consider how we may do that going forward. Great. Thank you, Charlotte. Um, just something that, that uh, I guess has come to mind for me, it, it reminded me of, of work I did many years ago when I was at the BBC, where I was a, in a kind of partnership development role and trying to build a partnership between the BBC and the public library sector. But actually, um, how exciting that, that was and how much enthusiasm there was, particularly from colleagues in the library sector for working with the BBC. But in many ways, over time, the difficulties became more and more apparent in terms of expectations. So the expectations of colleagues in the library sector were that they could have access to lots of parts of the BBC, some editorial input, et cetera. And, um, and actually, over time, that partnership became harder and harder. And I felt really caught in the middle um, because the expectations from partners were greater than the reality that we could deliver on. And, and I find that really difficult to negotiate. And I suppose going back to that point that Jonathan Grant was making about civic wash, I guess there is a risk for people in the roles that, that you're all in of, of making kind of promises to partners about what you can deliver. Uh, and then finding it really hard actually to deliver on them uh, and that risk almost of over promising and then under delivering and I wondered if that kept you awake at night and how you manage that. Can I come in here Paul if that's okay? Yeah. Um, I think that's an advantage of the way that we've done it is we were showing them what we're doing already so the first thing we gave them, the first PDF with all this activity, it was all there. It was all happening or could be accessed. It was actually things that could be accessed. So we knew we could deliver on that. So we haven't yet made the many promises that we can't deliver on because yeah. we're basing it on what's happening. I think when we move to the next steps, that's when we're going to have to start, for our point of view, having that conversation. But for our point of view, I think it's now given the council trust in us because of those things we we were delivering and they could access, they were all there. Now they have this trust where they're coming to us for more things because we built that trust. Yeah. I think Sophie's point is, is very good. I mean, in, in, in Greater Manchester, I think one of the one of the opportunities we've got now is to turn through our governance, turn these high level um, ambitions into really specific things which we're confident we can deliver. Um, However, what I'd say, and this is the, what's in common between the London and the Manchester experience, whilst we might have a small number of measures, I think it's the colleagues from London, somebody used the phrase, and again, sorry, I don't know which person mentioned this, but about your own, the way you work in your own structures to have an impact internally. So as well as being accountable to the public, I'd like to think that certainly for those universities taking a collaborative approach to civic engagement, that what will come out of there is... Um, 
some mutual learning about um, some of the most useful and least useful ways in which you can engage the public. And I think it's, it, so that collaboration, I'm quite optimistic that, you know, I've learned quite a few things off Michael and Charlotte and I like to think vice versa and we can learn things together and improve our practices. And it may be a particular way that we've got something um, approved through our governance quite quickly or something we commissioned or an approach we used around engaging the public. And I think you're much more likely to listen and learn from somebody on your doorstep than in your own context than somebody in a different part of the country. So, I mean, you, I know in your last presentation, Paul, you talked about this nice journey from the beacons of public engagement, which began in 2008, I think it was, wasn't it, 2008 to 2011, and to where we are today. And I think over time, learning from local actors, I think is something, as well as being accountable to the public, being accountable to each other um, to suggest and to support and cajole, cajole sometimes each other into um, being the best that we can be. So that, and I really heard that in the London examples. And certainly whilst our approach has been quite different to the London one, I can pick out specific things that I've learned from my local universities as well. And I'm quite optimistic about that. It's a new form of partnership, a new form of sharing, which I think we've lost a bit perhaps if you went back five, seven years ago, and I think we started to get that back. And I think the Civic University Network's a great example of this. I love these sessions, just to listen to other people and learn. I learned so much. I think that's a really good thing about this. Yeah. Can I just say, Paul, I think it's important to put in context, you know, these agreements don't replace what individual institutions do in their own local communities, and shouldn't. I mean, this is, this is about collective action to, to give you an amplification to reach bigger audiences, maybe to deal with strategic issues, maybe to get, as Julian says, learning and shared experience from others. But this shouldn't just be an excuse not to do what you should be doing in your, in your back garden, you know. And some of those local community engagement issues we have in our, in our particular part of Manchester, you know, they are, they are unique to us. They're our, our responsibility in a way. But they should sit alongside an agreement. This is not, you know, so your, your point, Paul, about over-promising, you know, this, this, this doesn't basically put all your existing individual work on the shelf. It adds, a, it adds a layer of collective activity, which hopefully amplifies the work that you do and help, in, informs it and, and makes it better in a way. But I think it's important to put that in context as well. That's really helpful, Michael, thank you. Yeah. Okay, I think we're sort of coming to a, a kind of conclusion for this session. And I just wondered if there was anybody who, who would like to just speak into, into this conversation to put your camera on and, and, um, and to just share a reflection or a comment or, or put one sort of final question to us. So, so that invitation is very open to, to anyone if you wanted to put, put your hand up um, as, as we draw to a close. Uh, but as I wait to see if anybody is, is bold enough to take that, I, I guess the final question for me just concerned resource and and actually what what it takes in terms of investment to get this work to happen and to stick and and for us collectively to be able to make a very clear case about what we think this work takes um, in terms of the support that our universities are able to provide for it. I, I wondered if you had any lessons learned about actually what kind of investment you think universities need to make in order to get work of this quality to actually happen. Any reflections on that? And then Rebecca, I'm delighted to see your hand up. So I'll come to you in a, in a couple of minutes. I think it's important we have dedicated people for these roles. I've worked with other unis where they've got a press officer or someone else trying to do this work, which yeah. isn't their job and it's an add-on. And I think Manchester is similar. It's the point to the senior leadership team or the vice chancellors. Um, all of us are doing that. And I think you need that um, buy-in from senior leadership within the structure. Yeah. We've all got very different structures after that um but i do think having that person you can go to that is a specific part of their role is really important yeah anyone else want to build on that i was going to make just a point which is about sort of um, secondary resource so i think everyone will come to their decisions about what resources are required both you know internally and, and we have some people obviously that are working with this city university agreement board but I mentioned in, in the, my remarks that we, we did get some work commissioned from Public First. So I think sometimes an external body giving you that uh, resource helps. And there's a legacy about that too, in the sense of, I mean, Julian took you through the polling and you know we're not just gonna chuck it on the shelf and ignore it now. Mm -hmm. So that's, there's a sort of a, 
a pipeline effect of that where we can start to use that you know, externally commissioned work to help inform yeah. us. So sometimes as well as the question, what resource do we need internally? There's also a question of, you know, what what expertise we might get from our side. And also, as Julian said, you know, with these, the network's going really well and these events are really great. So it's, it's, it's about secondary resources as well as primary resources around, well, who the hell's going to do the work on this now? Yeah, yeah. Great. Okay. Thank you. Um, Rebecca, do you want to put your camera on and um, introduce yourself? And uh, the floor is yours. Yeah, excellent. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to say um, thank you to both the universities that have presented. It's been really useful um, to kind of see that contrast between um, having an agreement signed and delivering it but also that those initial stages um, so I work for Nottingham Trent University and my major role is delivering the universities for Nottingham um, a civic agreement but I started in September last year so I didn't get to see those initial conversations that were kind of being had between um, the various different partners um, and I think it, it our agreement is slightly different um, again and actually it's this conversation to me at least has highlighted how different and how flexible mm -hmm. these agreements need to be based on the geographical location that you're working within yeah. Um, so yeah it was just those reflections and to say thanks mm -hmm. this has been a really useful session Great. yeah absolutely and I think sort of understanding those differences and, and what they mean for the kinds of work we can do um, and being able to explain those uh, I think is is a key job for the civic university network actually to sort of help um, because every geography, every um, every location that universities are working in sets different challenges and provides different kinds of opportunities. So, yeah, I, I just thought, um, going back to our London colleagues, you did mention something that I'm sure everybody's always interested in is money. And the fact that you had actually found a way to secure a at least a collaboration on a big bid. I don't think you've actually had the results yet, but maybe just to end with, um, there's always gold at the end of... of um, good fairy tales <laughs> what's the potential payoff in terms of, of that investment so yeah so the three universities here we've all uh, we're all partners on an nihr bid to develop a research platform um in tower hamlets so that that's something that um we like to think came out of our conversations across the three universities and it's definitely you know they came to us initially as three individuals to say can can your university sign up to this with us and what would that look like and um, it was a very sort of uh, collaborative process to develop the bid itself so I think it shows there are opportunities out there to secure external funding around particular themes um, there's also you know I guess as Rebecca has said and and for anyone here listening kind of is try my advice would be try not to get too overwhelmed or think that you need to do everything for everyone if you don't have that resource yet or that capacity it's sort of thinking about what do you have the space for? Who are the individuals in your area that you might be able to reach out to and just have that initial conversation? And sometimes once the ball gets rolling, what I've found is that I'm then able to put in business cases internally and demonstrate the impact over the last year or the progress that we've made. So slowly, I think more and more people start seeing the value of the work and, and the potential impact going forward as well. So I, I think the funding opportunities come both internally and externally as soon as you get that ball rolling. And it can maybe it's a bit of a scary jump initially. Um, but, you know, fingers crossed on the bid. We'll see. Great. Wonderful. Thank you. And a, a lovely point to end.